Welcome to uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Mark Dan, Director of Governmental Affairs at FFRF in Washington, D.C. On today's show, we have the groundbreaking Florida State Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith. He represents the Florida House District 49, which includes the University of Central Florida near Orlando. In 2016, Representative Guillermo Smith became the first openly agnostic LGBTQ person elected to the Florida legislature. We'll talk with him about being a groundbreaking state legislate, legislator, the impact of the Pulse tragedy, and the ever-changing political landscape in Florida. And if you want to participate, uh, you can participate by asking a question on Facebook, or uh, I think we're going to put up on the screen, you can email askanatheist at ffrf.org. Um, and remember, the Freedom from Religion Foundation is a 501c3 nonpartisan group. We will happily accept your donations, but we do not and cannot take sides on partisan elections, and we can't endorse or any, any views like that. So, uh, Hello, how you, are you? <laughs> yeah, welcome to, welcome to uh, Ask an Atheist. And uh, you're very brave to come on. And we want to know, what is it like to be the first openly agnostic Latinx LGBTQ member of the Florida State House? Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you um, for having me on. It is uh, such a pleasure uh, to be a part of this ask an atheist discussion, although I identify as agnostic. Um, but most of all, it's just great to be here with the Freedom From uh, Religion Foundation uh, to be a part of this discussion. As you know, I represent uh, East Orlando in the Florida House of Representatives, and I was elected in 2016. And our campaign made history uh, because I became and was elected the first openly LGBTQ Latinx member of the Florida legislature, also openly and proudly agnostic. And that was a historic moment for our state because before then, there was only two openly gay members of the Florida legislature in our state's entire history. Uh, and my election happened just months after the tragic shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando. That tragedy took place on June 12, 2016, um, pretty much in my backyard. And uh, it was an attack, certainly on the Orlando community, but also on the LGBTQ uh, Black and Latinx community that was disproportionately and deeply impacted by the tragedy. 49 souls were taken by hate uh, and by gun violence during that shooting. and. In the aftermath of the tragedy, so many of the inequities that exist amongst LGBTQ people of color were really exacerbated and made worse by the tragedy, the, the displacement of jobs for those who survived and for their surviving uh, family members, the inability to access uh, health care or mental health care uh, to deal with some of the consequences, certainly of the of the tragedy, but also a broken immigration system. You know, many of those who were directly impacted by the tragedy were either themselves or had family members who were undocumented. So being elected to the Florida legislature as someone who is a part of the LGBTQ community in Orlando, an LGBT person of color, to have the honor of being their voice in Tallahassee while also working alongside impacted communities um, has been really, really, really important for us. And I think, Mark, you had a follow-up question about that. Well, has the culture in the Florida legislature changed since you arrived? I would say it certainly has changed. Now, it's, it's changed for a number of different uh, reasons. When I first arrived in the Florida legislature. Um, there was a there was a lot of there was a lot of moments early on in my freshman year uh, where I really had to decide 
where I was going to pick and choose my battles. Uh, and certainly as an LGBTQ person who um, makes it a point to do my best to uh, create relationships across the aisle with uh, Republican leaders, even leaders who were uh, known to sponsor anti-LGBTQ legislation, I think that if we're going to change hearts and minds, that we have to understand that that's not short-term work, it's long-term work. And, and most people are able to, if, if they're able to move on from their own biases, their own phobias, it's usually from personal experience and interaction with those uh, folks that they have uh, tried to marginalize. Uh, and so I think that open dialogue has been really important. What's also been really important, Mark, uh, is especially as an agnostic, uh, making sure that we do not only promote uh, the most popular religions. First of all, I don't believe that a government has uh, a role uh, in, for example, praying uh, during uh, a legislative meeting. The, the practice of the Florida legislature has been that there's always a prayer, an opening prayer before we begin right. session. Right. I don't participate uh, in that because I don't think it's appropriate for a government body to be praying. Uh, as Has that gotten as weird looks from your colleagues uh, that you don't uh, participate in that prayer? Well, I have the benefit of being in the back rows. Uh, I don't. I don't. Maybe I can call it a benefit, but uh, as a member of the minority party, I'm in the back. So normally, when I go back into the bubble and don't participate in the prayer, it goes it goes unnoticed. But what? But here's so, Mark. Here's been my observation. My observation has been uh, you you almost never actually I don't recall ever in my four years of service having a um, having someone from a different faith be able to, to come up and do the prayer of the day you know we haven't had any mom uh, you know hmm. someone representing the Muslim faith the Islamic faith uh, doing the day of prayer we never had uh, a humanist uh, you know there's so many minority religions at least in our country that were never represented so actually I invited wow. T. Rogers, uh, in my first year uh, in the Florida legislature, T. is a, a humanist uh, chaplain at the University of uh, Central Florida, and she gave a, a humanist invocation um, because I followed the rules, which was first come, first serve. If you <laughs> want to bring up a, quote, uh, you know, a pastor of the day or clergy of the day or whatever. <laughs> so I I decided I'm like, you know what I I never participate in this but if this if this tradition of right. of prayer is going to exist we need to be inclusive of all faiths uh, including humanists and 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 other traditions so we had T Rogers and she performed uh, an amazing invocation uh, and it was to this audience which is a mostly Republican conservative um christian uh, audience i guess they weren't used to the fact that we didn't say amen at the end of the prayer <laughs> she should have said a woman <laughs> right right Car exactly carlos you represent a really well orlando is known as a fundamentalist hotbed and has has it been controversial for you to run have you had um obstacles to face as a candidate or in the legislature because of that and are you the only openly agnostic member of the Florida legislature? Do you know? Uh, I'm not, actually. I know that, and I don't want to uh, mischaracterize some of my colleagues, but, but I, I know that folks who who are, are in the agnostic or, or atheist kind of uh, uh, secular uh, group of secular Democrats include my colleague, Representative uh, Mike Greco, uh, and I know that there's some others that I'm sure just need the uh, proper encouragement <laughs> to come out as either atheist or agnostic. Um, but it, the challenges that I have faced have mostly been rooted in policy. They've mm -hmm. been less about my identity as an agnostic and more about um, what happens in Florida politics when someone demands accountability, for example, of 
voucher funded uh, private right. religious schools. Uh, this has been something that, you know, I've certainly talked to uh, Mark about in our advocacy work, but Florida has one of the largest voucher programs in the country. Of course, this is taxpayer money being siphoned away from our public schools into private educational institutions, a majority of them being religious institutions. And so we spend about a billion dollars a year in taxpayer money, a billion with a wow. B, which is a shocking amount of money, <laughs> to send uh, over to private schools. And they're unaccountable in a, in a number of ways. They're unaccountable in the types of teachers that they hire. For example, teachers don't need to be uh, certified uh, or, or meet these types of educational or experience standards. So, you know, we've, we've seen all types of individuals teaching in private schools. They don't have to follow any kind of curriculum standards. Uh, mm -hmm. An Orlando Sentinel uh, expose found that some voucher-funded private schools will teach that men and dinosaurs walk the planet together. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and right, right. And then here's the here's the big controversy that happened in the last year, which you know, caused a lot of uh, of conflict was the issue of non-discrimination of LGBTQ students yeah. in private schools. Uh, we discovered that at least 83 private schools uh, had policies in writing that said students who say, I am gay or I am trans will be expelled. Now, 99% wow. of these private schools funded with taxpayer dollars that were doing this were religious schools. Uh, they were parochial schools. Uh, and of course, when we proposed legislation to say that if you were funded by taxpayer dollars as a private school, you could not have overtly discriminatory policies towards students and their families, the religious right got activated. Uh, you know, they opposed our efforts and it was a very a bitter fight, one that we continue today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that was that was a huge, huge issue that obviously got uh, the religious community very engaged. And there was a lot of takeaways from that experience. That man, that is an awful lot to go up against for something that is just so fundamental. As, uh, and just want to remind folks um, that you can uh, send us your questions on our Facebook page or send them to askanatheist at fffrf.org. Um, as we turn to um, the Pulse tragedy, uh, which occurred, as you mentioned, during your first campaign, where were you when you got the news? So I was at home asleep when I received the news because the news broke very, very early in the morning um, on June 12th, 2016. And I remember receiving push notifications on my phone from news sites like CNN mm -hmm. saying that there was a possible mass shooting in an Orlando nightclub. And when I saw that, when I was awoken by that push notification very early in the morning, I, I clicked on the link right away to see what was happening and where it was. And I immediately saw it was Pulse Nightclub, which um, yeah. which was just, a, I mean, it was just shocking to see that this was happening in a club that I've been to many times. Uh, it's an LGBTQ nightclub. It happened on Latin night. And some of the first things that went through my mind, Mark, were, um, who was there? Uh, we didn't have any information yeah. on fatalities. We just knew that it was a, a mass shooting situation with an active gunman. And I went on social media and everyone was already posting about it, saying that they were safe. Uh, and then when we started to hear about the fatalities and just the gravity of the situation, I, I panicked and I, I, just try to make contact with as many of my friends and acquaintances as I could to confirm that they were okay. And within a couple hours, I had to stop doing that because there was work to be done. So I headed over to the LGBTQ center, which ended up being 
uh, a home base of, of many, uh, in many ways, people were bringing water, they were bringing food, they were looking for information and the tragedy unfolded from there. And it just, the news just got worse and worse. How did that change the direction of the campaign and your view on life? Well, as an LGBTQ uh, Latino who lives in Orlando, I was devastated uh, and so deeply and personally impacted by this tragedy. Um, I know people who survived the shooting, um, both people who survived gunshot wounds and um, are still dealing with many mental injuries as a result of the tragedy. Um, I knew someone who was killed as well, and I've seen the long-term impact that this shooting had on the lives of so many people. Before the Pulse tragedy, I was always a staunch advocate for common sense gun safety laws mm -hmm. and a champion for fairness and equality. To see these two issues intersect in such a horrific and tragic way for me really crystallized my commitment to advocating for these two issues and doing it in a way that was bold, authentic, and really just as, as important as these issues are, we had to elevate these issues to the forefront. The first bill that I filed, Mark, mm -hmm. after I was elected, was a bill to ban assault weapons in large capacity magazines. Good. A bill that didn't get a hearing for two years wow. until another mass shooting unfolded in our state yeah. in Parkland yeah. two years yeah. later. And to be clear, our bill never got a hearing. We had to force the legislation as an amendment on the House floor, which of course Republicans um, rejected. But the, the, the deep and lasting impact on this community in Orlando is still ongoing. Mental health is still a very, very important need uh, in this community. And what was interesting to see, Mark, also, was how the religious right, in the days and weeks that followed the Pulse tragedy, some opened their doors and opened their arms. And I even saw some of them ask for forgiveness and wow. how wow. they had treated LGBTQ people um, and the pain and suffering that rejection of LGBTQ people in religious spaces had caused the community even you know, certainly before uh, the tragedy. And while we certainly haven't <laughs> reconciled so many of these differences, I do think that a silver lining of the tragedy uh, is that there were more churches, more faith leaders in our community who uh, embraced LGBTQ people for who they were and began a dialogue. That's really remarkable. And I think it speaks to what you said earlier about having uh, being able to speak uh, candidly with your colleagues on the in the Florida legislature and being able to have those earnest conversations. Can you tell us about one of the victims of the tragedy and what he meant to you? Well, True Linenen was the one of the 49 angels from the shooting who was an acquaintance of mine, someone who unfortunately died in the shooting with his partner, uh, Juan Guerrero. Um, I knew Drew as an acquaintance that had uh, attended many community events, LGBT events that we had seen. Um, but most of those folks who I've been most close to have been some of the survivors as well. Survivors like Brandon Wolf, survivors like Angel Santiago, Angel Colon, uh, Ricardo Negron, people who have had to deal with the long-term consequences of gun violence, not only dealing with survivor's guilt, but also dealing with the loss of chosen family, the loss of their best friends, PTSD. And so what I've learned as someone who uh, has been an advocate for people dealing with mass uh, shootings in their communities 
is that sometimes as time goes by, things don't necessarily get better. Sometimes they get worse. And that's why it's so important for us to have strong mental health programs, uh, programs that specifically help those who are dealing with PTSD, as we have championed in our time in the legislature and helped fund uh, many of those local programs here. Uh, and we'll continue to do that work. And last note on polls, uh, despite all of that tragedy, how did you meet your husband? I met my husband, Jarek, actually at a event hosted by Projecto Somos Orlando. I love that photo <laughs> of our wedding. <laughs> So Projecto Somos Orlando uh, was a project, is a project of the Hispanic Federation, and the Hispanic Federation did an incredible amount of outreach to Latinx LGBTQ people in Orlando after Pulse, and they had a social event one night in Orlando um, at the venue, and that's where I met my husband, Jarek. And uh, it's funny because sometimes when I tell this story, um, people laugh at me because when I first met Jarek, I thought he was straight. Which <laughs> <laughs> just, just tells you how terribly broken my gaydar is. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we started dating um, soon after that meeting. In fact, the first date that we went on was the, the night that Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, um, where his family is. Uh, and so when we started doing a lot of outreach uh, in the Central Florida community for those Boricuas who live here who have family on the island and helping those who were displaced as they moved to Central Florida, um, Jarek immediately actually jumped in to help. Uh, and he was just someone who I uh, was just starting, uh, starting to date and uh, starting to have a relationship with. And um, because like me, he really cares about our community um, it ended up being a great fit, and I love him very much. Fantastic. So, Carlos, you were raised as in a Roman Catholic family, is that right? That's right. I was raised Catholic, and I went through, well, most of the sacraments. I you know, was certainly baptized. Uh, I was confirmed in the Catholic Church. But I... I now identify as agnostic. I left the Catholic Church as someone who was practicing Catholic because I did not feel like I fit in. I did not feel as an LGBT person who was still in the closet respected because I heard all of the homophobic views and the homophobic culture of the Catholic Church and, you know, it made me realize this is not, first of all, they're wrong about me. And the judging of LGBTQ people was just not something that I was comfortable with or understood. And, you know, it, it also damaged me as a young person. It made me doubt myself uh, as, as so many folks who grow up in very religious homes or in religious institutions you know, the, the constant brainwashing, telling people that they can, that who they are is wrong uh, and they can change who they are. But if they don't, whatever happens to them is their own fault. You know, that type of toxic messaging can really take a toll, uh, which is why so many young LGBTQ people are vulnerable and need support. But I exited the Catholic Church, if you can, if you can call it that way, really because I didn't feel like that was a place that I could call home. Uh, and as I became an adult uh, and questioned everything, uh, even religion and our existence as a human uh, species, I, I also understood that I didn't think that religions had all, all the answers. They could provide answers for many, but that I began to identify as agnostic because as so many agnostics do, I don't reject the existence of a higher being, but I also don't necessarily have hard evidence uh, to uh, to disprove it. And that leaves me somewhere in the middle, which is why I call myself agnostic. Well, at the Freedom From Religion Foundation, even though we call this show Ask an Atheist, we like to joke that right. um, 
regardless of what we call ourselves, we all disbelieve in the same gods. Hundred percent, hundred percent right. Which so, doesn't mean that there's a disrespect of religion, by the way. Um, I deeply respect religion, which is also why sometimes, especially when um, I see news about the Catholic Church, what they're doing, what the Vatican is doing, what the Pope is doing, I feel a personal investment in trying to help the Catholic religion evolve on so many issues, because it's a place that I used to call home, so it's personal. So speaking of Catholicism, you had quite an experience, I think, last year when you and your husband had visited the Vatican. Could you tell us about that? Well, that's right. Um, just like I mentioned to you, you know, we are respectful of religion uh, and religious individuals as well and institutions. And, you know, while we were in Europe, uh, actually on our honeymoon, it's it's hard to do a tour of Europe without uh, without going to see the churches. OK, so <laughs> whether you're in Spain or England or France or Italy, it does. I mean, there uh, there are so many to see and, and you'd be really missing out if you didn't go. But we did go to the Vatican and we uh, experienced St. Peter's Basilica as guests. And near the end of our visit, uh, my husband and I were holding hands outside of St. Peter's Basilica. You know, we were we were in the Vatican itself, um, but we were outside of the church holding hands. And uh, we were approached by uh, someone who worked for the Vatican who was trying to discreetly warn us and tell us uh, that it is against uh, Vatican law and Vatican policy for two men to hold hands. Uh, and he was essentially warning us that we could be fined uh, if we uh, continued to hold hands, which I, I was <laughs> shocked. I was shocked by it because, you know, see, I got a lot of feedback on that, like being like, well, don't you know? Well, don't you know that this is how Catholics feel about LGBT people? And, you know, weren't you being disrespectful by by this show of, uh, of affection? I, I mean, I deeply disagree. I, first of all, we we were outside of the church. Yes, we were in the Vatican, but no, I don't believe it's disrespectful to one's religion to show affection for your life partner by holding hands. Uh, uh, and and the fact that people, even well-meaning people who are on our side, feel differently just speaks to how religion has really brainwashed a lot of people into thinking that not having respect or treating LGBTQ people with dignity is somehow a religious value. Right. Well, and look how quickly they, they jumped on this at the Vatican and how slow they've been in response to the sex abuse scandals. So their priorities are a little backward. A little bit, a little bit. And, and the movement is happening at a glacial pace, at a glacial pace, you know, and, and obviously this, this Pope has, has appeared, in my opinion, to try to move the needle forward on treating LGBTQ people with dignity and respect, but there's certainly a lot, a lot of work to be done. And when you were in college, uh, one of your, you and one of your friends were a victim of a hate crime. And some of our religious friends find it bewildering that a person can find strength, comfort, and a moral compass outside of faith tradition. If you don't have a particular faith, how do you find strength from a tragedy like that? Well, the reality is, is my experience as a survivor of hate violence, and just as a human, is that you don't necessarily need, need religion to establish core human values, nor do you necessarily need religion to be able to find a support network from other humans. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in that experience for me, the support system that I had was chosen family. I use that word very intentionally because sometimes uh, sometimes people's own blood family, their, their own, 
you know, parents, their own brothers and sisters are not supportive of people who are LGBTQ in their family and people have to turn to uh, friends, people in their community, folks who I call chosen family, who are always there for you, who love you unconditionally. Um, and that condition is certainly not based on your sexual orientation or your gender identity. Uh, and as a survivor of hate violence, I was able mostly to rely on chosen family uh, mm -hmm. to be there to support me. Uh, but even in times of, of happiness uh, and success, um, I have found the support, the uplifting positive effects of, uh, of love for one another outside of the church, certainly through my husband, but also through my chosen family uh, and support group as well. And um, you talk a lot about chosen family and especially how it pulls you through tragedies from Pulse. And then of course, with the hate attack, it's really just uh, remarkable about how that's really a constant theme in your life and how it has just had such a strong impact. And as we uh, look towards Florida and Florida politics, were you surprised about the election results in Florida? I was disappointed, Mark, but I was not surprised. Maybe that's because I'm a little jaded about Florida politics. Uh, you know, it just get it was a feeling of deja vu the night of the 2020 mm -hmm. election in Florida because I was reminded of our. Uh, statewide losses for the governorship and other important races in 2018. I was reminded of Hillary Clinton losing Florida in 2016. <laughs> I was reminded of our gubernatorial candidate losing in 2014. So I, I, <laughs> I had kind of braced for the worst. Right. Um, but what here's here's where I think we can really learn. Um, I think we can really learn from states like Georgia. You know, we look at our neighbor to the north and we see that what was long considered a red state finally broke through thanks to lots of investment in communities of color and other marginalized communities as as led by and organized by Stacey Abrams, amongst many others. I really feel like that is uh, a key to success for progressives for people like myself, of course, for Democrats, I know that this is a nonpartisan organization, but I'm a Democrat talking about my point of view for future electoral success. And I think that that includes making sure that like in Georgia, that we don't just invest in or have a presence in minority communities right before an election. It has mm -hmm. to be something that's continual and something that's year round which, by the way, is not a foreign concept. We hear that after so many elections, especially uh, elections in Florida. So to put more meat on the bone, I think what that means is actually showing up in these communities on a regular basis, even just being there, even the, even the visual representation of being on Spanish language TV, of, of hearing Democrats on the radio uh, in Spanish radio, uh, showing up to churches on Sunday in the Hispanic and black community when it's not election time, mm -hmm. uh, and being there doing the work with these communities on a regular basis, I think really, really will make a difference. And not being afraid also to embrace policies that might seem taboo, and that the far right does a great job of uh, framing as extreme left policies are actually not extreme left. It is not extreme left to be agnostic or atheist. We represent a sizable proportion of the population and, and growing. It is not left wing to support a $15 minimum wage. A $15 yeah. minimum wage just passed here in Florida on the same election day that Donald Trump won the state. So what does that tell you? It tells you that Republicans, Democrats, and no party affiliated voters support a $15 minimum wage. The same as it relates to legalizing cannabis, for example, something that to this day, every time I file a bill legalizing cannabis for adult use, people are like, whoa, that's really wild. That's really bold. And I would respond by saying, uh, 
that's not what the polls say. The polls don't say that this is really wild or really bold. They say it's pretty mainstream. So it's just about how you talk about these issues, I think, can really make a difference. And I think it's just good common sense policies that just make sense to people when pe- when folks uh, think about it and take away a lot of the rhetoric that sometimes seems to trap us a little bit um, right, for those right. ideas. And, 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 on, and on that note, Mark, I just want to say, even when it comes to religious freedom, um, voucher funded private schools, for example, uh, I've been attacked by my political opponents as being anti-religion because of the fact that we advocated very boldly to say that these religious schools that were funded by taxpayer monies should not be allowed to expel a student for being LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. So what I would say very clearly, um, just so that your viewers understand, this is not an anti-religion point of view. It is communicating the very clear and very popular core value. Oh, I just lost the light here. Let, Let there be light. (laughs) <laughs> oh my! That's light. Give me one. Second. So yeah. Well, while you find your light there, uh, I wanted to uh, direct another question you could be thinking about, which <laughs> is uh, the greatest. Op- what do you think might be the greatest obstacle to progress in the Florida legislature? Well, and sorry about the light situation. I was so animated in what I was saying <laughs> that I un- unplugged my ring light. But but just to finish my thought. You know, to require standards of private schools to not discriminate against LGBTQ students, for example, uh, as a condition of receiving taxpayer money is not anti-religion. It's actually making sure that these types of values, which claim to be based in religion, that we're not using taxpayer money to promote these values that discriminate against other communities and harm other communities. These these faith-based schools have every right to run the schools the way they see fit and even the way their religion calls them to, but not with taxpayer money. Yeah, exactly. Taxpayer money comes with a set of standards and conditions which include not inflicting harm particularly on LGBTQ students by expelling them simply for being who they are. And then, and then what was your question? Well, (laughs) in general, uh, what would you see perhaps as the greatest obstacle to progress in the Florida legislature? I think partisanship, partisanship is the biggest obstacle to progress because look, Democrats are in the minority in Tallahassee. And so what often happens is if a good idea is presented in in the form of a bill, if the person, the sponsor has a D next to their name, then it's just immediately rejected as a non-starter. You know, we're not included as part of the conversation and nothing happens. You know, it's why even as a progressive, even as a liberal, as someone who is constantly holding Republican leadership accountable, Every time we get a Republican on our side on an issue, whether it's holding private schools uh, that take taxpayer money accountable and raising the standards, whether it's uh, legalizing cannabis for adult use. And, you know, we have some Republicans that support that. I always welcome that because we understand that a bipartisan support is necessary Uh, to be able to enact so many of these important policies, whether people perceive them to be progressive or not. And of course, that's true on the national scene, too. 100 percent. And what do you think has what do you think Florida has gotten right on its covid response? And where do you think it's gotten it wrong? Well, when it comes to coronavirus, how much time do you have left on your show? We're, we've got all day. You're uh, the one with the tight schedule, so here, we're, we've got look, time. Here's what I'll say. Um, I would not want to be in the governor's shoes because, look, this is an incredibly difficult crisis to have to manage, and these decisions 
you know, whatever the decisions are, whether they're decisions to close businesses, close our schools, enact mandates, enact COVID restrictions, they're not easy decisions, mm -hmm. at least initially. But now here's what I'll tell you where we've gone wrong. Florida is one of 13 states in the nation that has no statewide mask mandate. Wow. We also um, rushed into phase two and phase three reopening, even when Florida did not meet the criteria for a phase three reopening as outlined by the White House's own coronavirus task force. Now, as we have seen, Florida has become the third state to have over a million coronavirus uh, positive cases. And yet on the same day that that was announced, the governor said that he was absolutely taking off the table any additional COVID restrictions to mitigate the spread of COVID. And, and the context here is that we have some of the least restrictive policies in the country. So we have nowhere to go but up as far as requiring more. And what's also unfortunate is that the governor has changed his position on these issues a number of times for political expediency. I'll give you an example. His first excuse for why he would not require a statewide mask mandate is he said that Florida is a very big state and what works for one community does not necessarily work for another community. Okay, I disagree on the issue of universal masking, but a reasonable person might agree with that position. He followed that up months later by, by signing an executive order, stripping mayors and local governments of their ability to enforce local COVID-19 restrictions. So he went from saying, I'm sorry, we can't have a statewide policy because some counties and cities need to have their own and that's fine to saying now cities and counties can't enforce their own policy what this is all that about makes no sense. just yeah it just yeah and so mayors signed a bipartisan letter to the governor just a couple weeks ago saying please reinstate our authority let us be mayors let us for example find individuals for not wearing a mask let us be able to enforce social distancing policy. Let us be able to say, no, you cannot have um, a packed bar on a Saturday night mm -hmm. where no one has hand sanitizer, masks, or social distancing happening. The governor has, has refused to reinstate that authority. And in the two videos that he has pushed out since the election, because he's now not taking questions from reporters, he's not once mentioned that people should social distance or wear a mask. He's just wow. completely given up on hmm. any mitigation strategies whatsoever. And um, he's just not taking this seriously. And he's not supporting those who are struggling economically as a result of COVID. Yes, close to 19,000 Floridians have died from coronavirus, which is just a, 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 a stunning and tragic number that is so large, it's almost hard to comprehend how much pain and suffering that represents for so many families. But the economic consequences, one in five small businesses have closed in Florida due to coronavirus. Millions of Floridians have been pushed into poverty uh, and are unemployed. And yet, Florida is one of seven states that never uh, enacted any COVID relief or dispersed a legislative COVID relief package. None. We've not given small businesses a dime in support. That's shocking. The... That's shocking. So sometimes it seems that Florida can be mysterious in how it acts and how it's behaved. So what is the national media missing about Florida and what's going on that folks across the country just aren't seeing? Well, when it comes to um, just the diversity of our state, look, a lot, I mean, most states across the, this country are diverse, but Florida is uniquely diverse. Just, you, you know, you see, you know, in, in there's like five media markets in the state of Florida. 
uh, and everyone has a different, a diverse audience. When you take, for example, Hispanics and Latinos, which we know are not a monolithic group, right. Um, right. We, we also understand that the way that we talk to Hispanic voters a lot of the times has to be similar to how we talk to white voters, frankly. This is not just a turnout universe where, you know, a lot of political consultants use that word to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we just push these votes to turn out, they're going to vote for us and it's going to be fine. That's not true. We have to persuade uh, Hispanic voters not only to turn out, but to vote for Democrats, that we are the ones that are standing for small businesses. Most uh, small businesses in Florida are minority owned. We are the ones standing up for strengthening our public schools, which so many minority families uh, benefit from and want to see improve. We are pushing access to universal health care, uh, which is something that in not, not having access to disproportionately impacts communities of color. One in four Hispanic residents in the state of Florida is uninsured. Uh, so there's just a, a number of issues that we have to do a better job of communicating to Hispanic voters on as a party for us to be able to really find the key to success in our state. Well, uh, <clears throat> Carlos, it's been wonderful talking with you. Fascinating. Do you have time for a few questions? Sure. And Mark, do you have access to those questions? Yeah. Um, so we have um, uh, we have a question from Al um, Alexander DeWitt. Um, I have a question for what uh, for what is the Florida legislature planning on doing in response to Governor Santis, DeSantis's unethical and possible illegal raid of the former data collection personnel? And I'd follow that up with, if you were governor, what would you do differently than Governor DeSantis? Well, for those who don't know, that's a great question. For those who don't know, um, this made national news this week uh, when we saw that a former uh, Department of Health uh, employee, one that was fired, that has been essentially a whistleblower on the DeSantis administration's um, manipulation of COVID data, that she actually had her house raided by FDLE, uh, that guns were drawn on her by law enforcement officers and uh, on her children, as we saw uh, in the video of that raid. To me, that raid reeks of retaliation and intimidation of a whistleblower. They didn't even arrest her or bring charges against her. So even if the allegations that she uh, allegedly hacked into the emergency management um, communication system are true, uh, why didn't they arrest her or bring charges against her? And it doesn't justify uh, an armed intrusion uh, mm -hmm. and raid of her home as we as we saw there. So as far as what can be done, I would join in calls from some of my colleagues, including members of Congress, uh, who are demanding an investigation into those actions. Because to me, to hear the governor's spokesperson say, as they did a couple nights ago, that the governor had absolutely no knowledge and zero involvement uh, in this raid, to me, is just not a credible statement that's not credible and as far as what i would do differently if i were governor DeSantis, well, i would sir I, where do i start i mean i would certainly <laughs> certainly uh issue a universal mask mandate which costs the state absolutely nothing in taxpayer resources and i would be modeling different behavior i certainly wouldn't be attending trump rallies that have become super spreader events without a mask and then high five dozens of people at the rally and then immediately follow up that maskless high fiving by wiping my nose as the <laughs> governor did on camera. OK, so modeling, modeling important behaviors and being a leader is certainly a start. But also at the same time, we find ourselves in an interesting situation in Florida where Democrats are not trying to shut down or, or shut down businesses or enact another lockdown. What we're asking for is for the ability of local governments to be able to enforce COVID restrictions. Your bar can be open, yes, 
but you have to follow the guidelines. People have to be wearing masks. There needs to be social distancing. You cannot pack your bar or restaurant mm -hmm. past capacity and expect to remain open. You know, those businesses need to be held accountable. There is a way to do this. It's certainly going to come with risk, but there is a way to keep these businesses open while being responsible and curbing the spread of COVID-19. Another thing that I think is very important as far as what should have been done differently, what Governor DeSantis did was he knee-jerk, closed bars down for mm -hmm. a nearly two-month period and actually offered them nothing in return. I'm a Democrat who believes that not only is government important in being able to mitigate the spread of, uh, of a coronavirus pandemic like we have right now by enacting restrictions, but we also have a responsibility as government to provide a safety net to those industries that have lost revenue as a result of these government restrictions. DeSantis just shut them down and gave them nothing. Wow think we should have more smartly enacted restrictions and then offered things like a uh, commercial rent assistance and other grants to small businesses so that they don't have to fire their employees. And again, uh, back to neither Democrat nor Republican ideas. It's just what is good common sense and what can help folks. And our last question of the day, as an agnostic, how do you forgive or can you forgive someone like Omar Mateen, the murderer of the Pulse tragedy? As an agnostic, um, it's an interesting way to pose the question. Here's, here's what I'll say first. I heard um, very powerful and emotional words from the parent of one of the 49 angels, one of the 49 who was taken during the Pulse tragedy. And she's a, a, a deeply religious person. And she said that she forgave the gunman for his crime because she believes that um, that that God has the ability to forgive all of those people who have committed sins. Uh, and in this case, obviously, it, an act of, of evil. It is not for me to disagree with her. Or, or certainly get in the way of what her religious beliefs call her to um, call her to 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 do um, and treat those who have caused her harm and great tragedy and, and this deep personal loss. But I can say personally that as I watched the trial of his wife, for example, who, in my opinion, uh, aided and abetted this crime that while some someone might be might have the ability to forgive they also need to be held accountable and i believe that um that the courts got it wrong that she needed to be held accountable as someone who aided and abetted this crime and they didn't hold her accountable and there's a lot that's not forgiven at least from my perspective yeah i, I don't know why you have to forgive it frankly the accountability is the issue here so, well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, getting acquainted with you. I think you have a brilliant career ahead of you. <laughs> um, maybe we'll be seeing more about you running for governor or Congress, um, Representative Guillermo Smith. And we really are um, thrilled that you joined us today and we're willing to talk plainly about your views with us. Well, it's great to be here, Annie. Thanks to you. Uh, thanks to Mark. And thanks to FFRF for having me on today. Ask an atheist, ask an agnostic like me. Ask me anything. You can follow me on Twitter at Carlos G. Smith. Same on Instagram and Facebook. Fantastic. And be sure to check out FFRF's broadcast TV program, Free Thought Matters. This week's guest is Annie Drian, creator of Cosmos and co-writer with her late husband, Carl Segnum, of some of your favorite science fiction books, including Demon Haunted World. You can watch Free Thought Matters on TV stations around the U.S. on Sunday mornings or on FFRF's YouTube and Facebook channels. And check out Free Thought Radio, FFRF's weekly radio show and podcast, FFRF.org. 
uh, backslash radio. And again, a big thank you to Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith from Florida. Yes, and if you want more information about the Freedom from Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. And we'll be back next Wednesday at noon Central Time with another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist.